I'm Cynthia Lawrence, and for those of you whom I've not met, I am the Head of Workforce Development for Carilion Clinic, and I have the privilege of serving as President of the Shenandoah Club. And on behalf of the board and staff, I want to welcome all of you to this very special event, which is part of our Business and Public Affairs Speaker Series. The club also has a speaker series called Ladies Who Launch, which features women who are making an impact in business, education, and the arts. We're delighted to host Cardinal News, our distinguished legislative guests. Luann will introduce them here in a bit, and members of the Roanoke Collaboration Project. The Collaboration Project is partnering with Cardinal on an initiative called the Cardinal Way, which is an effort to renew civility in the public square. And I'm wearing several hats today because I'm also honored to be a member of RCP. About three years ago, Jay Foster and Dana Ackley had the foresight to found this group of civic-minded volunteers who believe that collaboration across diverse stakeholders is key to making communities more resilient in the years ahead. We believe that to tackle the complex and systemic problems that we face, like lack of affordable housing and gun violence, to name two, requires that we must rededicate our efforts to build trust, recognize the dignity of every individual, extend mutual respect, and work together for the common good. We're also dedicated to helping our communities model the skills of constructive dialogue to help overcome the divisiveness that seems to have been thrust upon us by society. And we must pass those skills on to our children. We should all have a voice in the conversations that will shape our future. We must agree that reason and persuasion, constructive dialogue, are the only ways to conflict resolution. Effective communication, beginning with each one of us, in the spirit of collaboration, is one of the cornerstones of a healthy society. And that's why I'm so excited about partnering with Cardinal News and looking forward to today's conversation. Cardinal News represents journalism at its professional best. The staff and board operate with the highest integrity. They care about their craft, about the Commonwealth, and they care deeply about the future of Western Virginia. And all of you, too, care deeply about Western Virginia, and that's why you're here today. Before I turn it over to Luann, let me ask Dr. George Anderson, senior pastor at Second Presbyterian Church, and an RCP member to come and give us an invocation. Whether in prayer or solidarity, would you bow with me? Holy author of creation and moral order, we ask your blessings upon our food and our time together. For ourselves, but also for those who govern us, help us keep in mind the rights and dignity of others even those who look and think differently than each of us. Let us never tolerate hateful ideas or speech. Help us to know how to build bridges and not walls. Help us to find what unites us even as we disagree. Help us find sure footing on common ground so that in seeking the greater good, we can find a place to begin together. Grant us the virtues of empathy and compassion even as we boldly speak our truths and strive to have our voices heard. Make of all of us Virginians servants, so that in the end we can advance the hope implied when we say the word commonwealth. For when we are at our selfless best, it is common well-being we seek. In the name of what is decent and good, we offer this prayer. Amen. Thank you, George. And now feel free to continue enjoying your lunch, and I'm going to turn it over to Luann Wright, the Executive Director of Cardinal News. Welcome, Luann. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. This is working, right? <laughs> okay, great. Welcome. It's so great to see so many familiar faces in this room, and I'm seeing so many new ones as well. 
And I want to thank you, Reverend, for uh, invocation and the use of the words common ground and commonwealth, because that is what this gathering is all about. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Lou Anne Rife, the executive director and co-founder of Cardinal News. And today's event is the first for us in the new year, and it's also the first in our Cardinal Way Civility Rules Project. I want to thank Senator Locke, which is here, and Senator Obenshane and Delegate O'Quinn for agreeing to participate and traveling such a long distance to join us today. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Shenandoah Club for hosting this event, uh, Blue Ridge Public Broadcasting for taping the event, so those who couldn't join us can view it later, and you can check our website for some details as to how to do that later. And I'd also like to thank the Roanoke Collaboration Project for partnering with us on this event today and with our Cardinal Way project. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know why we're doing this. So when we launched Cardinal News as a nonprofit, we knew a few things. One, we would need to abstain from partisan politics, and that was okay with us. <laughs> Two, we knew we were doing this in part to counter the growing misinformation and polarization that occurs when independent journalism is lacking in our communities. And three, we knew we would not allow our news site to be overrun with anonymous commenting that feeds the trolls and just sucks the humanity from the rest of us. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to see people agree with that. Um, still, you know, uh, some of you in this room know me as a reformed commentary editor, editorial writer, and editorial page editor. So, you know, there's a big part of me who's always thinking, oh gosh, there is a space for thoughtful, civil debate among informed people. Um, and so, you know, how could we do this? How could we adhere to those three things that bound us and still look for informed speakers and writers? And so last year, when the American Press Institute announced it would offer grants from its civility project to promote civic discourse, I thought, this is our chance to try an experiment. And we knew the Rona Collaboration Project was already working in this space. And so I reached out and said, hey, would you like to partner? And they were, what do you want from us? <laughs> what would you like us to do? And I said, don't know. We'll figure it out as we go along. So we're calling our project Cardinal Way. Uh, you know, I, mean, I think everybody in this room is familiar with Virginia Way. Well, this is the Cardinal Way, and we're putting civility rules, and you can look at that several different ways. And each Tuesday, we post new commentary to our website, and you can find it in our newsletter on a debate of a particular issue. And if you haven't already started to read the Cardinal Way, I suggest you look at for the essays. Take part in the audience polls, and please offer suggestions for topics and speakers, and perhaps you're one of our next writers. I truly believe that we can bridge the huge partisan divide by bringing together people with differing viewpoints, not to score points, but to find common threads that can stitch together consensus, or at the very least, allow us to see the humanity in each other. Duane and I had also often talked last year about the huge change that would occur in the General Assembly with so many new senators and delegates that would be elected. And despite which party would emerge in the majority, we knew change was coming. And most of the newcomers would know nothing about our region. They'd know very little about us, our communities, and our issues. And so we thought, how could we tie this into our goals around Cardinal Way? And that's a good place to start would be to ask Virginia's legislative leaders to come meet us and begin a dialogue. So let's get started. Dwayne, would you like to introduce our guest? Thank you for coming. I see a lot of people out there I've covered in the past. Um, <laughs> rest assured, I'm, I'm much more comfortable on that side of the room than up here, but you won't have to hear me for long. Uh, I will keep the introduction short so that we can hear from them and not, not me. Uh, we have in the middle Senator, Senator Mamie Locke from Newport News, Chair of the hmm? Hampton. Hampton, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of those places. <laughs> Chair of the Senate Democratic Caucus. We have Senator Mark Obenshane from Rockingham County, Chair of the Republican Senate Caucus. And at the end, we have Delegate Israel O'Quinn from Washington County, 
uh, who for the moment is the Deputy House Majority Leader, come next week will be the Deputy House Minority Leader. Uh, you may wonder where a House Democrat is. Uh, we have one lined up for, for a while, uh, and then House Democrats decided that their senior leadership would meet in Richmond today. We said about trying to find a substitute, um, but could not. The, the, re the political reality of the state is when you get a party shift, you also get a geographic shift. Um, so as you know, there's only one Democrat west of the Blue Ridge in the House right now, and he is in Richmond today for a meeting. So with that, we will give each of them an opportunity to talk about what they see coming up. We'll start with Senator Locke. Good afternoon. Um, as Dwayne said, uh, when I got his email, I said, you know, uh, were you looking for the Democrat who had to travel the farthest? <laughs> um, and so um, it's, I'm Mamie Locke. I represent the 23rd uh, Senate District, which used to be the second, which Mark now represents. So I'm getting all of his emails. Uh, <laughs> And um, that's, that's where your emails are coming. Um, and an interesting thing is Mark and I were both elected uh, in 2003. So we're classmates. Um, and so we are entering our 21st year um, in the Senate, which makes us old heads. Um, uh, because uh, there has been a shift, uh, as was indicated, uh, with a lot of new people uh, coming into uh, the General Assembly this year. In the Senate alone, I think we have 17 uh, new people um, coming in, uh, which means that uh, there is a learning curve uh, for a lot of our new people uh, who are coming in, uh, which means that Mark and I, quite frankly, are, are folks who've been there for a very long time, which you know, 21 years, quite frankly, is a long time. Uh, for folks to have been uh, serving um, in the Senate, uh, which makes us, which is why we're in leadership roles, um, for because the Senate uh, operates on seniority, um, and because of that seniority, which is what's elevated us uh, to the positions that we hold, <clears throat> which uh, has also elevated um, those of us on uh, the majority side uh, to positions um, of chairmanships. Uh, I also chair the Senate Rules Committee um, and serve on some committees that you won't hear about today. Um, you'll hear about on Wednesday. Um, so uh, what uh, is responsible for this shift is every 10 years you get some redistricting going on um, and that redistricting uh, is probably what, not probably, it did lead uh, to uh, a lot of the changes that took place uh, in this last election cycle. Um, uh, because of the fact that we did an experiment with the commission uh, that still made it um, in not being able to uh, do the redistricting, so it defaulted to the Supreme Court that ultimately uh, do, did the redistricting. Uh, and those that suffered in that redistricting were the incumbents uh, because uh, the masters didn't care about incumbents. You know, that was not their priority. Their priority was to draw lines. Uh, and in drawing those lines, they of course put incumbents in with other incumbents you know, um, and the decision of many of those incumbents was, do we run against another incumbent or do we retire, do we leave, you know, and those decisions were made, which is where we ended up where we are um, with the last election cycle. Um, and um, I made some remarks at the last Virginia Free Lunch, um, and I was also per surprised that I got asked to do that. Um, so, and I was, you know, did you make a mistake? Um, but, um, and because I wanted to, I started out by saying, um, after the November 7th election, um, I felt that the business community thought that just like Chicken Little, 
uh, that the sky was falling uh, because Democrats had been elected uh, to remain in um, leadership in the, in the Senate and had um, resumed leadership in the House and therefore the sky was falling because uh, Democrats don't care about the business community. Um, and uh, my response to that, that that was in no way true. Um, in the 23rd district, I have lots of businesses um, and businesses that I care about. Um, in my community, I have NASA um, as you know, a, a leading business in my community. I have Newport News Shipbuilding as one of the largest businesses in my community. Um, and I have a lot of small businesses that are the bulwark of my community. If you ever come to visit me, the first place I'm going to ask you if you want to eat is Mango Mango, which is one of the, my favorite places to eat. Um, and, um, and second only to that is the baker's wife. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, I care about those businesses in my community. And, um, and I want them to survive, not only to survive, but to thrive um, in my community. So it's not that as a Democrat, I don't care about the businesses. I also care about the workers in those, in those businesses. And I want them to also thrive. I want the schools in my community to thrive. I have an institution of higher education. I also have a community college. Um, in my district, and I want all of them to thrive and survive. I want the families to thrive and survive. So uh, that's what I care about. I care about families. I care about the schools. Um, and for you to understand where I'm coming from, let me tell you a little bit about who I am and where I come from. I was supposed to be a statistic, you know. Um, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, um, one of 11 children. Yeah. My father was a World War II veteran, um, but uh, he died when I was a child. Um, and uh, so my mother raised the 11 of us as a, as a hotel cook. Very good one, too. Um, <laughs> so I learned a lot from her. Um, <clears throat> and grew up in public housing. And that's why I tell you I was supposed to be a statistic. You know, growing up as one of 11, um, and with that single mother as a hotel cook, you know, um, everyone kept saying, you know, oh, she'll be a teenage mother. She'll be a substance abuser. You know, uh, because that was what children of te of a, my mother was not a teenage mother, but um, being one of 11, growing up in public housing, that's what you, you know, that's what you're supposed to be as a child of a single mother. But I grew up in a community that cared about me. I grew up in a community where people said, if you do something wrong, not only am I going to get you, <laughs> you know, but we're going to tell your mama and she's going to get you when you get home. You know, I grew up in a community where teachers cared about me. You know, and so, and I also grew up in a community where I was told that you can do something with your life and that education is the great leveling field. And that if you get an education, that's going to be your way out of this public housing. And that's what's going to be the thing that elevates you to do better in life. So that was what was important to me and to my family. You know, and so I graduated from high school as a valedictorian of my high school class. You know, didn't have any money to go to college, but I was a part of a program called Upward Bound. And if you don't know anything about Upward Bound, that was what got me into college. You know, and I was able to go to college 
as a consequence of Upward Bound. Yeah. And was able to go to college, graduate from college. You know, and I, while in college, they told me, oh, you need to go to law school. You need, I, I don't want to be a lawyer like Mark. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, and all through college, they said, you need to go to law school. You need to go to law school. And all the way through until I was a senior in college, I'm like, I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> I don't want to be a lawyer. But that was what I was being pushed to do, pushed to do until I was a senior. And I said, I'm not going to law school. I'm not doing it. I want to be the archivist of the United States. Nobody in the world knew what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> so I applied to Indiana University to their PhD program in history and Atlanta University to their PhD program in political science. Atlanta University gave me the most money so that's where I went. Um, but I digress. Anyway, ended up at Atlanta University, got a PhD in political science. Ended up at Hampton University as a professor in political science. Um, so th that's what brought me to Virginia, Mark. Sorry. I've heard that I was story. At, okay. So, <laughs> story. <laughs> so um, and uh, taught urban politics, sent my students to city council meetings. You know, you need to, this is your community, you need to know what's going on in your community go to city council meetings. Uh, they came back one day and said, we don't like what's going on. I said, fine, I'll go with you. Didn't like what was going on, told my co colleagues, they said, run for city council. I said, I'd rather talk about politicians than be one. <laughs> um, ultimately ended up running for city council in Hampton, ended up becoming the mayor of Hampton, ended up in state government as a member of the state senate. That's how I ended up where I am here today. Why? Education. Because somebody back in that public housing project told me I could do it. You're not going to be a statistic. You can be somebody. You can do it. You don't have to become a statistic. Education is the great leveling field. You can be somebody, go out there and do it. That's why education matters so much to me. That's why I push so hard for education as a member of the Education and Health Committee. That's a priority for me. And it, it will always be a priority for me. As a chair of the subcommittee on higher education, for both that committee and for the finance committee, that is why I am so I mean, I am so passionate about education, you know, because that is what got me to sitting in this chair right here this, this very day. Because education is what got me to where I am today when I talk to children even to this very day about who they are and what they can become. I tell them the story of that little black girl, the Mamie Locks of this world, who grew up in public housing that, that, that is not who you are and don't let that sub, 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 circumscribe your life because it doesn't have to. Because you can become whoever you want to be if you use your brain and it can get you to wherever it is you want to be in your life. Education is my number one priority. Public housing, you know, and affordable housing is a second one, and voting rights. Why voting? Because when I turned 18, that was the first year that 18 year olds could register to vote. Yeah. Remember where I said I grew up? Voter suppression. I had to register twice. Because I, could, I had to register for uh, state and federal elections in two different places. I was fortunate. I lived in the state capitol, so I just simply had to walk across the street. What about those folks who didn't live where they could register for the federal election in one place and the state election in the other place? That was voter suppression. So I am always concerned 
about the ability for people to be able to exercise their right to vote. You know, those things are important to me as a person, not as a Democrat, as a person to be able to exercise that right in a democratic society. That is what's important. Education, affordable housing, the right to vote. As a freshman in college, Roe versus Wade passed. All my adult life, that was a right. A right that was taken away. A right that was taken away that I had all of my adult life. I don't care what your personal beliefs are, as a right, I should make that choice about who, the decision that I have to do with this body, this is my body, let me make that decision with my body. Every woman should have that right to make that decision with her body. No one else should make that decision. That's all I got to say for now. I'll turn it over to Mark. <coughs> Let him say whatever he wants to say. <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> it is uh, it's a distinct honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, Mamie and I were elected the uh, same day, same year, took office the same day, and uh, she has a uh, compelling and uh, wonderful personal story, and it's always a delight to hear that. And uh, from her personal story, you can uh, tell that she's somewhat modest about <laughs> the about, about the reason for her success in uh, ascending the ladder in the General Assembly. Uh, Mamie is a very skilled legislator, a very skilled leader. Uh, her position has nothing to do with her seniority, but everything to do with uh, her skill as a legislator and a leader and uh, a person who commands respect on both sides of the aisle. So it's a pleasure serving with Mamie. It's a pleasure to uh, be here today. Uh, our moderator up here, you know, we're trading places because Dwayne, uh, he grew up in Rockingham County, or at least his family's from Rockingham County, and uh, I've got an uncle over here from uh, Botetourt County, and, uh, and actually, I, I had not realized this, I wish I'd known this two years ago, but two years ago was the 100th anniversary of the election of Boyce Putney Obenchain as the first and first Republican sheriff of Botetourt County, Virginia. And uh, it is uh, good to be home, uh, in, to my family home uh, in the uh, uh, Roanoke Valley, and uh, I've always felt uh, uh, welcome here, and it's always good to see so many of my good friends here today, uh, not least of which Bob and Mary Ellen Goodlatte. Bob's been a wonderful friend over the years and a uh, great mentor and role model uh, for me, and uh, I just appreciate all that Bob's done for Shenandoah Valley, for the Roanoke Valley, for the New River Valley, for Virginia, and for America. So, Bob, it's great to see you. Uh, you know, Mamie uh, talked about the uh, turnover in the General Assembly, and uh, first of all, I have to say, the sky did fall on <laughs> November 8th. <laughs> but we'll muddle through. Uh, we've done it before, and we'll do it again. Uh, but I, I looked at some of those numbers, and I just want to share a couple of things with you about the composition of the, uh, at least the Senate. I'll let Israel talk a little bit about the uh, uh, House of Delegates, and Israel's been a good friend for uh, 10, 12, 15 years, and uh, is a great uh, uh, colleague in the House of Delegates and a great leader there as well. But uh, the redistricting commission, I think Mamie and I would probably disagree on the wisdom of the adoption of that, but I trust the voters of Virginia, mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, we did put that to the voters, and uh, the redistricting commission did pass, and uh, it did not quite work like we'd expected it to. Right. When uh, it went to the commission, uh, the commission was in theory a uh, nonpartisan, uh, bipartisan kind of conglomeration 
of people who were supposed to try and find a common path towards fair uh, and impartial redistricting across Virginia. And, I, you know, I'm not quite sure they entirely got the message. And uh, they wound up deadlocking along partisan lines uh, in trying to adopt a new map. So it went to the Supreme Court of Virginia. And the map that the Supreme Court drew was a map that pleased absolutely nobody, nobody. <laughs> and uh, upset just about everybody. everybody. I was put in a district with two other uh, members of the Senate. We were triple bunked. The number of people who were double and triple bunked in the House and the Senate was enormous. And I've got a theory about that. I, I really believe that the Supreme Court, when this landed in their lap, they decided that this is never, ever coming back to us ever <laughs> And I truly believe that that commission, when it is uh, put together in 10 years, that they will have a different outlook on the nature of their job. And there will be, I believe, a uh, successful effort in the commission and through the commission to redistrict the Commonwealth of, Virgi of Virginia in a way that maybe makes a little bit more sense and isn't quite as disruptive. You know, we're going to see uh, uh, how it works out over the next couple of months and over the next couple of years. Uh, I think it's going to work out okay. Uh, you know, of the uh, new members of the Senate, we've got, we have uh, actually 40 members of the state Senate. And uh, as of next Tuesday, 20 of them will have been elected within the past year. 20, one half of the members of the Senate. And people have looked at that and commentators I say that with wonderful respect for my <laughs> friends and uh, moderators here. Uh, uh, commentators have said it's going to be a disaster. Uh, it's not going to be a disaster. Uh, we have actually, of the new members, uh, there are, I guess, 12 Democrats, 9 Republicans. 11 of those come with prior legislative service. Eleven have come from the House of Delegates or have served in the Senate before, uh, which means there are nine who have not uh, served in the, uh, in the Senate before. Uh, many of those have served on school boards and on city councils and on boards of supervisors who are in other elective offices and understand the nature of a uh, collegial body and uh, the responsibilities and the ways that we have to deal with one another. And, uh, you know, when I speak at events and, frankly, uh, the, there goes my sound. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, public television, but uh, in, uh, when I speak to high school groups, I can tell you that invariably the number one question I'm asked is, why can't you all just get along and get things done? And uh, I will tell you that the dirty little secret is we, do. we actually do get along. And we actually do get things done. You know, I tell them that uh, probably 85% of the things we work on is just <coughs> fixing problems, just solving problems. They're not Republican problems or Democrat problems. They're not liberal or conservative problems. Uh, they're just problems that need to be fixed. Unfortunately, many of them are problems that we made. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they just need to be fixed. And we have a pretty doggone good track record of working together across partisan aisles to get those things fixed. The other 15%, I call them cats and dogs issues. They are the reason we have Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives. They are the things that we are supposed to disagree about. They represent those deeply held philosophical differences, some of which uh, Mamie was very articulate in expressing here just a few minutes ago, that uh, you know, really uh, uh, they define us. Uh, they are why we got into politics to begin with was because of our deep belief in those principles and views. We share common goals. Uh, education is a priority for both of us. Uh, education is a central function of you know, government. 
uh, we've got to figure out a way to do a better job of making sure that our children across the Commonwealth of Virginia, not just in Fairfax County, but across the Commonwealth of Virginia, get a world-class education. Uh, we're going we're gonna to work together on that. We're not going to always agree on how we're going to do it, but we're going to work together to try and achieve that goal. Uh, we are uh, absolutely committed uh, to uh, try to find bipartisan solutions where we can. One example, uh, that, that wonderful road that I traveled down from Harrisonburg. Uh, I'm glad you got to experience Interstate 81. I'm glad you got here safely, Senator Locke. But uh, I will tell you that, uh, I, uh, and, and uh, in a minute you'll understand, none of my colleagues will drive with me. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've had this. two uh, experiences that have changed my life. One, I was driving south on Interstate 81 and in the right lane, at, driving the speed limit, uh, and uh, a tractor trailer goes blowing by me, did not see me, and I uh, pulled over into the right lane, clipped the front end of my car, and or the back end of my car, and the next thing I saw through my side window uh, was the grill and bumper of that tractor trailer pushing us sideways down the Interstate 81 on the passenger side wheels of my uh, car. And uh, praise God, we spun out on the other side. And uh, next thing I saw was uh, uh, two rows of traffic headed straight towards me <laughs> as I was traveling 65 miles an hour backwards down the Interstate 81. Uh, fortunately, we uh, escaped that with just uh, a total car, but no injuries. Two months ago, three months ago, maybe four months ago, but I was coming down Interstate 81 uh, driving a Roanoke, and uh, I got to Stanton, the northernmost Stanton exit, and uh, uh, there was an SUV driving in front of me, and I couldn't see around it. And s tractor trailer beside me, heavy traffic, driving with traffic, and all of a sudden that SUV veered to the right and coming at me in the fast lane of Interstate 81 going north in the southbound lanes was another SUV traveling full speed right at us. And uh, I steered to the right uh, thinking I was going to hit that tractor trailer which was better than a 150 mile an hour collision with a vehicle going the wrong way on the interstate tractor trailer moved over and that car zoomed by me and uh, I thought there was going to be a fiery crash behind me somewhere. Uh, the state troopers uh, later told me that that car clipped a tractor trailer, uh, stopped in the median and uh, when the state troopers got there they had to wrestle the driver to the ground who was having a mental health crisis uh, trying to kill themselves and anybody who got in their way. Now. These things happen all the time on Interstate 81. It is not a safe corridor. Uh, we created the Interstate 81 uh, Commission. Uh, it wasn't a Republican thing or a Democrat thing. Shannon Valentine, when she was Secretary of Transportation, former delegate from uh, Lynchburg, Ralph Northam, Secretary of Transportation, came to me and said, we need to work together on trying to find a way to improve the safety and reliability of Interstate 81. And we worked together and I carried the legislation, we created the commission. Uh, did I love everything about how the commission works? I do not, but we did it and uh, we actually got it done. Uh, would I like to see improvements happen faster? Uh, yes. Yes, <laughs> she's heard that before. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that we'll be able to work together to uh, achieve that. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we're going to be able to find things to work together on during this uh, session. It's going to be an interesting session. Uh, as you may have heard, we've got a Republican governor, got Democrats controlling the House and the Senate. Uh, there are going to be cats and dogs issues during the course of this session of the General Assembly. Plenty of them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to get anything done. We have important initiatives on mental health, on child care, on transportation, on education, and other fronts that we are going to be able to link arms and find a way forward. Are we going to like every aspect of it? Is Mamie going to like every aspect? She will not. Will I? I will not. 
Uh, but we're going we're gonna to advance the ball and we're going to get things done during this course uh, session of the General Assembly. I look forward to answering your questions. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, with that, I pass it to the Deputy Majority Leader of the uh, House of Delegates, Israel O'Quinn. Well, thank you, Senator Obenshane. It, it is great to be able to be here with you today. Um, I'm honored to represent part of Southwest Virginia, um, the 44th district, which is the city of Bristol, all of Washington County, and part of Russell County. That's the, uh, the new district that, uh, that I was given in one of the few rural districts that actually shrank in size. So I was thrilled with what the redistricting commission came up with. Um, <laughs> so uh, as, as uh, Dwayne uh, alluded to earlier, being the, the deputy leader for the last two years and getting ready to take that on for two more, um, a lot of people, you know, they want to know what that job actually entails. Um, it means that if you're in the majority, the speaker and the majority leader get to do all the cool stuff and take the credit, um, <laughs> while you get to be the complaint department and Mr. Fix-It. Um, and so, uh, so there's really, uh, really just a glorified HR director uh, is what you essentially get to be for your caucus. But I am glad to be here with uh, Senator Locke, Senator Obenshane, um, and certainly appreciate uh, Cardinal News putting, uh, putting, this, putting this on and give us an opportunity to get together and talk. So um, as I said, I, I, I hail from far southwest Virginia. Um, and I would like to take a moment to frame that for you. Senator Locke, I know Dwayne said you're from Newport News and you very qu quickly corrected him to you're from Hampton. People say all the time, I'm from Roanoke, and I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> so there's only one delegate actually, actually west of me. Um, and I actually, where my house is, live closer to seven other capitals than I do to Richmond. Um, if you drive an hour west of that, you're closer to eight. And if you drive one more hour past that, you're closer to nine. Um, and so, you know, from where we sit right now, I actually punched it into the, uh, to the, into the GPS. It's about four hours and 15 minutes to the Cumberland Gap from here. You can still be in Virginia. Um, and so, uh, in fact, Roanoke is about ha almost halfway to Richmond for me. So when I was coming in earlier, somebody said, it's great, we're so glad to have you here in Roanoke. And I said, it's always good to be in Central Virginia. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but truly, what that, what that creates, and, and there are a lot of reasons that play into that, but what that creates is a situation where people um, in Southwest Virginia feel very, very little connection to Richmond. Almost none, in fact. Uh, most of the districts in Southwest Virginia more closely identify with Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, or North Carolina than we do with Richmond. Um, you know, our, our constituents really see us as the primary, and in many cases, only conduit um, for them to state government. The worst thing you can possibly do to a constituent in far southwest Virginia is tell them they have to dial 804 to get an answer. Um, they don't want to hear that. They want you to figure out the answer um, and, and get back to them. And, you know, being uh, in, a, in a very rural district um, is a bit of a harrowing experience when you try to go to the grocery store or the gas station or to a school event uh, because you inevitably, I literally carry, when I'm, you know, out and about, I carry around a little notebook and write down, you know, all these issues and problems that you need to follow up on. Uh, but that's a good thing because it, it's a it's a high touch, highly personal um, experience, and so my whole legislative session is viewed through that lens um, of of representing people who rely on us to deliver for a region um, that has no connection whatsoever to its state capital. Um, and so, you know, I will say that Southwest Virginia, many of you know this, um, is is not like it's portrayed by a lot of people um, in the national media. I say, you know, the only place that it's actually socially acceptable to poke fun at nowadays is Central Appalachia. Um, and people have a whole lot of fun um, whacking us like a pinata um, for their own gain. Um, and those of us who are from here don't appreciate it very much. Um, and so there is a, there's a huge misconception. And again, that's why I appreciate Cardinal News because they highlight a lot of stories that would otherwise never get told. And a lot of the unique people and situations and organizations that are doing good in our area get highlighted. Um, and you know, when we mess something up in Richmond, you highlight that too. Thanks, Dwayne. But, uh, but, but truly, um, you do a really good job of, of highlighting things that, that need to be highlighted and tell the good story um, about our region. Um, you know, one of the things that always amazes people is that our public school system um, in Region 7, which is essentially Withville West, uh, tends to outperform the rest of the entire state. Um, you know, you tend to learn how to do a lot with a little um, when that's the hand that you're dealt um, over, you know, over centuries really um, and so so we have a very very good public school system in southwest Virginia a high performing public school system and low performing buildings um, which is one of the reasons why uh, we ended up uh, being able to pass the school modernization 
um, and construction uh, bill. That was one of the things that Senator McClellan and I had different approaches on for a couple of years in a row, um, and now Congresswoman McClellan, uh, but we were able to get that across the finish line, and that's one of those things that you can't get that across the finish line as just a Republican or just a Democrat. It's too, too big of a lift, too much money, uh, too many moving parts, and it's something that we had to find common ground on, and we certainly did. Um, you know, we have great higher education institutions right in our backyard in Southwest Virginia. Um, you know, a surprising chunk of the overall philanthropy in, in Virginia um, uh, gets, uh, gets given from very generous people in, in far Southwest Virginia. Um, you know, we have a great out, outdoor economy. Um, Virginia tourism, of course, gets to promote that. And uh, it's one of, the, one of the finest outdoor economies that you'll find um, anywhere um, in the entire country. And so, you know, Southwest Virginia really is a unique place. It is a good place. Um, and it is a, it's a place that I'm very proud to say that I'm from. Um, you know, Senator Locke was talking about, you know, her, the area that she grew up in. The area I grew up in was very different. Um, it was a very, very rural part of, uh, of Washington County, right at the base of Clinch Mountain. Um, you know, our, our public school at that point had grades K through seven. We didn't have the middle school system yet. When I was in fifth grade, our school was closed because we couldn't keep our ADM over 100 total students over eight grades. Um, so pretty, pretty rural area, um, you know, but, but an area full of, uh, of, of good hearted people um, who, who just want to just want to live in a, a good community, safe community um, and, and, are, and are constantly trying to put their best foot forward. And so even though I grew up in, in that very rural area, um, you know, through my various work experiences over the years, I've been fortunate to go to every single locality in Virginia. There aren't very many towns. Um, that you can name in Virginia that I haven't been to at some point um, over, over the course of my career. And so um, it, it's one of those things where it, um, it gives me a different perspective though, to not only to represent the area that I'm from, to be from the area that I'm from, but to have been to all these other areas and, and still travel to them on a regular basis. And so I always say Virginia is deceptively large. Just get in your car and decide you're gonna go from Roanoke to Virginia Beach to Fairfax back to Roanoke and you'll figure out just how big it really is. Virginia is a very, big state uh, with some very unique and varied interests. Um, Senator Locke was talking about the various businesses that we have. I mean, we have everything ranging from, you know, agriculture and natural resources to tech and defense and everything in between. Um, and so, you know, it's for those reasons, among others, that I think that this particular session um, is going to have a whole lot of gravity to it. Um, and it's something that we're going to have a lot of big issues that are coming up that uh, may be things that we've had a little bit of deferred maintenance, if you will, um, and it may be things that because of the political reality we're in that they bubble up to the top. Um, and it could be any number of other reasons why some of these issues are going to come up and are going to require um, going to require attention. So things are certainly going to be different. You heard uh, both of our prior speakers allude to that. Um, you know, you have a situation where Democrats control the entire legislature by technically the thinnest margin um, that you can have. Um, you know, I've been in, th in thin margin on both sides of that um, and on any given day you think you're in the majority and guess what, you got two members that have the flu and all of a sudden you're not. Um, and so, you know, it's, um, you know, we joked at one point we were going to have to roll a hospital bed in the back and if you're sick, you got to stay there. Um, but you know, then as, was, as you heard earlier, Republicans control the three statewide offices. So you're going to have an interesting situation where you've had for the last two years, but where you have a Republican presiding over a Democrat controlled state Senate. So um, certainly creates an interesting dynamic, I'm sure. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, for the House members, we're going to have, I counted them earlier. I think I got this right because we're getting ready to have one more new, and I think it's going to be 35 when we take, uh, when we take the, the oath on uh, Wednesday. Roughly, I think it's 60% of those will have four years or less of overall service. So when you look at the demographics, members are getting a lot younger. Um, and ultimately, I mean, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, if we don't figure out a way to ultimately start to pass the torch on some of these things, you just you walk off the edge of a cliff and then you're really in big trouble. So I do think it's a good thing that, that the legislature overall is getting younger. Um, I can remember being elected when I was young. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm not 31 anymore. <laughs> uh, and so, um, so anyway, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it time, things change. Um, this will be my 13th session uh, being in the General Assembly and things have changed a lot. But I will say that um, I thought it when I was in my first session and I still think it now that institutional knowledge does still matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the House and Senate still operates on a rigid set of rules. 
Um, and, and they're there for a reason. They're there so we can actually have real discourse um, and not have a meltdown like we have in, you know, in, in some, some forms of government, um, you know, in other, other, parts of the, uh, other parts of the world. So, you know, in looking at, at how I think session's gonna go, I think we have two different paths that we can potentially go down. Um, path number one is one that is an absolute, complete and total standoff. Um, you know, one where the House and Senate decide that we're going to kill all the Republican bills and then send a whole bunch of bills over to the governor who then says, well, I'm going to veto all your bills. There aren't enough votes to override a veto. So where does that leave us? Leaves us a status quo till January of 2026. Could that happen? Yes. Do I think that's going to happen? No. Um, because there is a second option. Um, there's a second option that's a whole lot better than, than option number one. Um, because we all have things that we care about, and you've heard a lot of those articulated already. Um, philosophical and ideological differences, and I always say people assume that every Republican is exactly the same and every Democrat is exactly the same. We've got 49 caucus members, and I'm telling you right now, we've got 49 very different Republicans um, in, in, our, in our caucus room, and that's okay. Um, you know, if everybody thinks the same, that's, there, there's, there's a form of government for you, and it's called a dictatorship. Um, you know, that's not... That, that's not what you need um, in, in any level of government. Um, you, you need people who can, who can think on their feet and, and know what they believe in. Um, you know, and we are all sent to, to represent our constituents. Um, and ultimately, we have to answer to those voters and we have to answer to our own conscience for the votes that we cast and the positions that we take on, on various forms of legislation. But I think if you take, take it, you know, back off and take a 30,000 foot view of some of the biggest issues that we face right now, you can rattle any of them. We just, you've heard some of them, you know, transportation, education, mental health, you name it. And if you take that issue and you put it on the table and you take the Republican ideology and you take it and you overlay it, and then you take the Democrat ideology and you overlay it, chances are there's going to be overlap in that area. And you're going to find somewhere in there where you can actually make real measurable difference on some of these big problems. Now, Senator Robinshane said it exactly right. In the end, on some of these things, you know, Senator Locke and Senator Robinshane are both going to be happy with what the ultimate solution is on some of those big things? Probably not. But I think in the end, we're all big enough people to recognize that if we make 75% of the progress that we hope to make on a big issue that really isn't a partisan issue, then we've had a good day at the office, um, to say the least. And so um, I think there's more overlap there than you think. There's more overlap, I think, than um, than, than national commentators like to, like to give it credit for. Um, you know, Republicans and Democrats agree on solving mental health crisis is not a very grabbing headline on, you know, MSNBC or CNN or Fox News. Um, it's, you know, it, <laughs> Cardinal News would like that headline, right? I mean, that's, uh, that, that's ultimately, uh, it's ultimately a good thing. Um, but it is always amusing to me at the, in, at the bills that suck all the oxygen out of the room. Um, you know, and when you look at, at not just the total volume of bills in the House and Senate, but when you look at the, um, the individual unique pieces of legislation, we'll deal with anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 pieces of legislation between the House and Senate. Um, you know, and, and generally, it's about 10 of, those to 10 of those bills that are the ones that get all the headlines. I mean, really, you boil it all the way down, it, it's typically 10. Um, give or take. And I mean, I've passed real consequential legislation before that I felt great about. It never came up for air. I mean, you pass the bill, it gets signed. It's like, can we do a bill signing ceremony on that? Why? I mean, you know, it just, uh, it just, it never, it never gets traction because it's not one of those, it's not one of those 10 bills. But every day we pass a calendar of uncontested bills. And some days that calendar will have 150 bills on it that we pass. And it's something that everyone can agree to. Now, some of them are pretty simple things. Some of them are not. Some of them are actually things that started off very contentious and, and got fixed. And, you know, even, even off the uncontested calendar, we can still pass bills in the House that have, um, you know, have, have big consequences and you can get 90, 90 votes on a bill like that. So um, all hope is not lost for being able to tackle some of these big problems. And so, you know, for me, I mean, again, I'm going 320 miles up the road to Richmond to represent the folks who sent me. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I'm not going to waffle on what I believe in. I'm not going to waffle on, on my, you know, my own personal ideology. Um, but 
I'm also going there to, to try to solve some of these big, complicated, very difficult problems. Um, you know, and for me, you know, I, I will be there and I will, I will treat my colleagues with respect regardless. And not everyone of the 140 General Assembly members adhere to that. And it's, um, it's always disconcerting when you actually see that happen um, in reality. And, you know, you have people start calling each other names in public. And it's just, that is not at all how, how it should be. And so, you know, in addition to being collegial, like we should be, um, you know, in the old overused saying of being dis you know, disagreeing without being disagreeable, um, it, that's a real thing. And so, you know, I think we also have to be as open as we possibly can with people. I mean, obviously there are times when you're trying to, you know, you might be trying to play hide the ball a little bit on something, but ultimately if you have no intention whatsoever of supporting some notion or some bill, just say it. It'd be great if people would just say it. Um, and then that way we know what we're dealing with. Uh, because I'd much rather have somebody tell me no right now than to tell me maybe now and tell me no the day the vote's being cast. Um, I can work with no. Um, maybe it gets a little complicated sometimes. Um, but, you know, for me, I also want to just strive to understand other people's point of view, where they're coming from, the area that they represent, what's important to the people that they represent, because they were elected exactly the same way that I was, by the same number of people, very different people from very different regions, but the same number of people who sent them there for the same reasons. And so I think the more that we can have situations like this where we can talk about those differences, um, the better off we're all going to be. Uh, and so, uh, you know, session's here. We go back in, we take the oath on Wednesday at noon, um, and, and, and it all begins. And we have real problems that are awaiting some real solutions. Um, so I'm looking forward to tackling those challenges, to hopefully getting some big things done. Um, and, you know, I, again, I appreciate um, Senator Locke and Senator Obenshane taking the time to come here and appreciate Cardinal News for putting all this together. So thank you. We have a little time for questions. Yep, I stand. Um, my name is Brenda Hale. I'm president of the Rural Branch NAACP, and that's 11 terms. Uh, when you go back, Senator Locke, tell Gaylin Cordnowton that you met me and uh, give our regards. The thing is that education is super important. But as a retired Army nurse and nurse from the VA and nursing in the community, premature lives, they're dying. Young people are dying in the streets. So we can't educate them because they're prematurely dying. And why are they dying? Gun violence. And here in Southwest Virginia, we're just as important as it is in Hampton, Norfolk, Tidewater, Richmond, we are just as important because a young person dying affects us the same as it does anybody in the state of Virginia. When you return, all I'm asking, and I need your assurance, that you will make sure legislation comes out of committee because if it doesn't come out of committee, it can't get to the floor to be voted on. it. And we're asking for funds and we want fair and equitable distribution of the funds. Roanoke, Virginia, Southwest Virginia is just as important as all the other cities. Just be fair and equitable with us to give us the money so we can continue the mission. If you don't know what we've done, we had the first gun buy buyback three years ago. We are successful in what we do. People trust us. They bring the guns to us. So every gun that you can get out of a house, that increases the chance that that young person can make it to elementary school, can make it to high school, can make it to college, or whatever they choose to do. It's important for us to have more money. The city, my good friend here, Stephanie Moon Reynolds, is a city councilwoman. They only have X amount of dollars they can give us. We need more funds coming from the state of Virginia. COVID gave us money to spearhead what we do, and we do a good job. I get calls from all across the country now. Tell us how you did this, and we want to do the same thing. Gun buybacks, that's just one part of it, but it takes so many of us working on the same mission, and that mission is save people from dying premature deaths, and it doesn't matter what age they are. 
There's another thing when we talk about mental illness. That's a higher rate of suicide by gun violence than by the actual killing in the street. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about that. And that's a very real problem. So please, thank you Cardinal News for bringing us here together. Thank y'all for traveling down 81. It's dangerous, I travel up and down it all the time. But the thing is, is thank you for being here today. And please give me the assurance that you're gonna to try to be fair and equitable to us here in Southwest Virginia. Thank you so much. Anyone want to speak to that? I think part of what uh, Dwayne asked us to do is that there was um, a lack of, uh, well, there is concern on the part of folks here in Southwest uh, Virginia that uh, there was no leadership in the General Assembly uh, from this part of the state and uh, that folks felt that you would be left behind. You can be assured that those of us in other, in other parts of the state feel that way too because of Northern Virginia. Um, we feel that there's nobody and there's the rest of us. Um, so uh, you can be assured that um, Israel won't be by himself um, in uh, looking out for uh, this part of the state uh, because I don't see myself as just being from Hampton Roads. Uh, uh, of course, I look out for my district, but I also look out for the state. I see myself as a part of the Commonwealth. Um, when I talk about education, when I talk about sensible gun solutions, when I talk about whatever issue we talk about for the Commonwealth of Virginia, I'm talking about the Commonwealth of Virginia and what's in the best interest of the Commonwealth, not just what's in the best interest of Hampton Roads or Northern Virginia or Central Virginia, what's in the best interest of the Commonwealth. Right there. Good afternoon, everyone. It's just wonderful to see this turnout here. Um, I'm Jay Foster on behalf of the Roanoke Collaboration Project. Thank you again for joining us today. I um, also want to give a shout out to Dana Ackley. Hey, everybody will see we got a little bit of a handout if you want to flip through that, but it does give some context to my question. The uh, RCP actually is trying to represent that moderate middle, the 86% that uh, I believe would love to see more of this. But one of the big lessons I've seen over the last couple of years is how do we model more of this kind of behavior that actually will solve the problems and go to that scenario number two that you talked about where we actually get things done. So my question is, uh, what can we do as voters in a democracy to promote more of this kind of uh, cooperation and break that cycle of divisiveness that's happening right now? And there's those anonymous trolls on the internet that basically want to threaten a primary so you won't do this anymore. Right? So that's my question. Well, it's a very good question, and I've got a couple of things that I would offer in response. Number one is model that kind of behavior. Uh, it is absolutely critical for people to uh, see civil uh, behavior and civil dis discourse modeled. People uh, in this room, your opinion makers in this community, and uh, you've got the opportunity to be the grown up in the room, even if it's a chat room or a, uh, a comment board on a, a website. Number two, uh, come to Richmond. Come uh, watch our uh, committees operate. Uh, log on. Uh, all of these committees are streamed. Mm -hmm. And you will see us every single day of the week working together uh, in a civil fashion to try and address the issues that are, are important. Um, you know, I think that uh, all three of us have said this in maybe different ways, but it is a lot more fun to read about those disagreements in the <coughs> newspaper, online, and see it on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, it sells papers, it sells subscriptions, it, it uh, gets viewers. Uh, it is not quite as exciting to talk about the things that we find uh, op as opportunities to work together on. And uh, when you see uh, us succeed on one of those issues that Israel talked about in which you know, 90 people voted for something that is really important to the Roanoke Valley, talk about it. Uh, talk about it. Uh, it is uh, really important to do that. Uh, and uh, I, I think 
you know, <laughs> with due respect to my friend uh, Bob Goodlatte, who probably agrees with this, uh, you know, we do it right in Virginia. Uh, I think uh, in Washington, th they do it wrong. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about the way that we do it is we're getting ready to go to Richmond, not for the year, uh, not for six months, but for eight weeks, for 60 days. Uh, next, last year and next year, it'll be 45 days. We've got to come home, uh, live in these communities <laughs> right. we represent, <laughs> right. uh, earn a living under the laws that we pass, meet payroll. Uh, all of those things, I think, change the way that we have to act as legislators in Richmond. I, I think that, uh, I, that uh, you know, there are lots of opportunities for us to do better. Uh, but I, I think that uh, those who think that it is fundamentally broken in Richmond, I, I, I think you need to mm -hmm. come, come see. Thank you. Hello, my name is Victoria Cochran, and I appreciate all of the words that you've shared here today. Each one of you, and Brenda Hale as well, has mentioned mental health issues and the significance of them. I've spent the last 20 years of my professional career trying to help improve our mental health and criminal justice system in Virginia, and we are still nowhere near it. And one of the things that I would like you all to take back with you to Richmond and consider is that the nuance involved in fixing this problem is huge. It is not a mental health problem. It is not a drug addiction problem. It is not a social criminal problem. It is not a people with mental disabilities problem. It is a combination of all of those things that impacts individuals' lives, throws them into crisis, or requires them to seek treatment. And when you funnel money the way that you do it now, it doesn't effectively help any of those groups. At least that has been my experience. And so one place I would like you to look, which is at odds with many people's beliefs, is at the Sexually Violent Predators Program where we civilly commit people who have served their time and basically hold on to them forever at great expense to the Commonwealth, when that money might be able to go to people whose lives could be greatly improved and become much better members of our society. So that is my comment. Thank you all. Anyone want to speak to that? You know, we engage in a uh, massive game of whack-a-mole in uh, gover governing. Every time we uh, find what we believe is a solution to one problem, uh, another, another one, one pops, pops up. up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, many of your observations I would agree with, uh, some I would disagree with. Um, you have in the past. I know I have, <laughs> and, I, and I will continue to, but uh, at least you know where I stand. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, I, think, I, I think that even notwithstanding our disagreement, uh, there is much that we can find to work together on. I, you know, we have groups every day who come into our offices that represent, uh, you know, philosophies or issues that upon which I, I have a fundamentally different view. I'm never going to agree with them on the major focus of their visit to my office. And uh, I tell them, thank you very much, I'll listen to them, but I say, we're going to disagree about that, now well, what can we work together on? Because undoubtedly there are things that we can work together on, and uh, mental health is, is absolutely one of those things that uh, is not, uh, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be divided along partisan lines. I see at least one more question. Can I, Dwayne, can I address that one? Um, the reason I didn't pay <clears throat> the reason I didn't pay attention to being on 81 this morning uh, was because I was on the Hampton Roads budget hearings uh, this morning, um, and I would say 75 percent of those who uh, were on those hearings were addressed uh, mental health. 75 percent. Um, it was either not enough money was put in, uh, 
there was money put in, but we need more. Uh, we like what was put in, uh, but it needs to be redirected. Um, people were calling in from CSBs, from uh, private providers, uh, home health workers. Um, it ran the gamut for uh, this is what we need to address what is an impending crisis. It is a crisis. Um, the money from COVID is drying up. How is the state going to uh, pick up uh, what the federal government is no longer going to pay for? So uh, it is an issue that we at the state level, of course, will continue to have to address. So it's just a matter of how we're going to do it and in what, in what direction we're going to do it. Looks like we have time for one more question. Um, thank you, Senators and Delegates, for uh, being here today. Uh, my name is Luke Pretty. I'm on Reddick City Council with uh, Councilwoman Moon and Councilman <coughs> Cobb, who, who's over there today. We have just began our budget discussions, just as the, the state's about to be entering mm -hmm. those. Uh, and we rely on our funding from the state uh, for our priorities, namely in public safety. It was unfortunate not to see 599 funding put into the introduced budget. Uh, but what's more important is the certainty as we're planning going forward. Over the past few years, there's been a, for one reason or another, there's been an inability to uh, complete the budget on time. So do you think we will have a budget on time this year? Yes. <laughs> Define on time. <laughs> He didn't will say it that. happen before June 30th? Yes, it will. <laughs> we don't have any alternative. Will it uh, happen after the close of the General Assembly session? I, I don't think any of us has a crystal ball <laughs> and can say uh, there's some big things in that budget. Uh, the governor's uh, introduced budget is always the starting point uh, for putting together the budget. Uh, everybody relies on it. We hear from our uh, schools all the time. We've got our teacher contracts that are dependent upon uh, passage of a, a budget. And I tell my school divisions, unfortunately, you've uh, had uh, plenty of practice in uh, trying to deal <laughs> with the timing uncertainty. Rest assured, we're going to pass a budget. So you can issue those contracts. Uh, we will. Uh, there are a lot of other things that are important. The uh, Virginia Research Triangle, uh, the uh, Freeland Biotechnology uh, uh, Institute, uh, and uh, VCU and uh, you know some of the other great uh, programs, the uh, uh, UVA uh, biotechnology uh, program mm -hmm. uh, are slated to receive significant support. We've got to be do a better job of competing right. with other states. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, uh, has more research dollars uh, coming into Georgia Tech than the entire Commonwealth of Virginia has coming into uh, all of our educational institutions so you know there's so many things whether it's mental health whether it's uh, local government whether it's research and technology and economic development uh, across transportation I do want uh, across the board we we've got to uh, uh, make sure that we uh, address those issues and you know the budget is the one that we always get done and we're going to find that overlap uh, it may not mm -hmm. be always pretty and it may not be by <laughs> June 30th uh, I hope it will uh, I hope that it's going to be by uh, March 15 or 12 or whatever day Ninth. we're supposed to adjourn. March 9th. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I really do. <laughs> but we'll see. With that, we will wrap things up. We thank you for coming. We thank our, our guests for coming. So.